gorilla and orangutan. So it's reconstructing how species evolved from a common ancestor. <coughs> By the way, this talk is on my webpage, so you can actually download it, um, and Sandy can show you where to get it, or I can send it. Okay, so uh, when you look at genome scale data, you get a problem called phylogenomics, which is the marriage of phylogeny estimation and genome scale data, so phylogenomics. And on the left, you see what is like the tree of all life, which in fact isn't even a tree, because there's this horizontal gene transfer from some part of the quote unquote tree of life to other parts. And, and then on the right, you have this Genome 10K, which is an organization, an international group of scientists who are trying to assemble the genomes of species across all of life. Okay, so you have genome scale data, and you have trying to get at the tree of all life. And the, the issue here is that, in fact, we don't know the tree of life. It has a lot of meaning for biologists. Once you have an evolutionary context, whether it's a tree or a network, you can use it to answer biological questions. And basically, everything in biology is assessed through the idea of looking at a phylogeny. But how do we get that phylogeny? And it's not easy. And this is a quote from the National Science Foundation text on assembling the tree of life. Resolving the tree of life, which is to say estimating it from data, resolving the tree of life is unquestionably among the most complex scientific problems facing biology and presents challenges much greater than sequencing the human genome. So don't think of it as salt. So think of it as like an opportunity to do some interesting research. And so from the perspective of computer science or statistics, it's really interesting stuff. Everything you want to do is NP-hard, and all the data sets are big. And so from a computer science perspective, this means we need to develop good methods that are, it's non-trivial to try to solve these problems well. Um, you're always analyzing methods in the context of a probabilistic model of evolution. So you're assuming your data are you evolving under some stochastic process down a tree or down the network, and you're trying to reconstruct that tree or network. Lots of mathematical proofs you need to do. Lots of simulations, lots of evaluation on data, both biological and simulated. Lots of graph theory. Anyone who likes graph theory, there's lots of graph theory here. Lots of discrete optimization. Or you could just say, I just want to be a statistician, and then you have statistical estimation, but what you have is a new kind of problem that requires new methods. So even if you think of it as statistics, <coughs> it still needs new methods. And the data are really messy. So heterogeneity is a big deal that I'll be talking about today. But large data sets, you know, so how many species are there on Earth? M many millions, you know, and you're looking at genome scale data. This is very, very challenging. Okay, so what this talk will be about is basically giving you a quick introduction to how people do phylogeny estimation, and then telling you some new stuff and some even unpublished stuff just from the last month. So is this going to be telling you everything? If you didn't know anything about biology, you'll know something at the end of the talk. Okay, so this is a cartoon of DNA sequence evolution. The idea is, well, let me just go back here before we go further. You remember we have the human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan? What you imagine you're doing is going into the genomes of these organisms and taking a stretch of the genome. And that stretch of the genome you're going to look at as a sequence of DNA nucleotides, so A, C's, T's, and G's. So you extract that string of A, C, T, G from the different species, and then you're going to use that to try to get an evolutionary tree. And this is a cartoon of how that string evolved over time. So you're thinking of the leaves of this tree as being different species. And you're looking at the genome from that different from the different species. So these could be human and chimp, okay? Just a string from the different species. If you look at this cartoon, this is the string from the common ancestor. And it's evolving down the tree, and the only thing that's happening is that the nucleotides are changing, right? This A changes into a T. This second A changes into a G. So on the edges, you see changes. And in some edges, there may be no changes. So the strings are changing down the tree, okay? So the strings are not changing in length. And this is a standard assumption under the usual sequence evolution models, is that the only thing that happens are substitutions. So you have a sequence at the root, and it's evolving down the tree, via substitutions. Okay, everyone got this? Toy story? Okay, 
And you can treat this then as a statistical estimation problem, where you have sequences that you see at the leaves of a tree, and you're trying to reconstruct the tree from the sequences. Okay? And this tree that you're trying to reconstruct is not rooted. Do you see that it, there's no root here? But the tree that generates the data is rooted. And the reason that you are not rooting it is that the statistical models are time reversible and you cannot locate the root. So just bear in mind we're talking about reconstructing unrooted trees. Now for computer scientists, we do look at unrooted trees. Okay? These are just you know, connected acyclic graphs. Okay? You're trying to reconstruct a leaf labeled unrooted tree. Okay? Okay. We can't do this without actually formulating it as a formal mathematical model. So this is an example of the simplest of the DNA models called Jukes Cantor. So the Jukes Cantor model makes a very simplifying assumptions of all the positions are evolving down the same tree. They all have exactly the same evolutionary process and they're all independent of each other. And the evolutionary process is very simple. All you need to know is the probability of changing on an edge. So the probability of change has to be strictly less than three-fourths for statistical reasons, strictly greater than zero. And if you change, then you change to any other nucleotide with equal probability. So that is not biologically realistic. None of this is biologically realistic, okay? You can make it more realistic by allowing an, ar like an arbitrary four by four substitution matrix. You can make it more realistic by taking rates of evolution across the sites. But they're all making the basic assumption that there's one four by four substitution matrix that sort of governs the tree and then you have expected number of changes on the edges and everything is IID across the sites. You don't have to understand what this means except believe me, it's simplifying, okay? It's very <coughs> simplifying. But if you'd make, yes? Is there any specific reason that you don't uh, in the, you know, unrooted rep representation of the tree, you don't even label the internal nodes? Well, the internal nodes are ancestors, and they're not part of your input. Mm -hmm. So your input's just the stuff that's at the leaves. Just the species. Yeah, the, the, the extant, so the current modern day stuff that you actually have access to. Um, so, but the, the details here don't matter. The main thing for you to realize is that there is a formal mathematical model, and you can talk about trying to estimate the tree under that model. Okay, and, and under that situation, you can ask, is the method statistically consistent? So how many of you have even heard this phrase, statistical consistency? Okay, no one. Um, <laughs> um, so the idea is that as your data increases, you have something you're trying to estimate, you want your estimate to decrease in error. So here's a simple example. I have a coin, and it has some probability of head, right? And so if you keep flipping the coin, you get a better and better estimate of the probability of a head. So your algorithm for estimating the probability of head is just flip the coin, right? And look at the proportion that comes up heads. That's your, that's your algorithm, and your data is the number of times the thing is, uh, the number of times you flip the coin. So as you flip the coin more and more, your error goes to zero, okay? And that's a maximum likelihood estimate. How do you take that idea and use it for trees? As you have longer and longer sequences, right, every position is your data, right? As you have longer and longer sequences, you have more information. How do you use that information to get the tree? Okay. More and more data, your error should go to zero. You can't, do, you can't prove this without a mathematical proof. You can't just do a simulation. You have to actually prove it. Okay, so the mathematical questions. Is the model tree identifiable? Which basically means every model tree gives you a probability distribution, for example, on sequences, right? But actually on positions, right? So as, does that probability distribution actually give you enough information to recover the tree? Does it uniquely identify the tree? That's a mathematical question. Second question, which methods are statistically consistent? Some are, some aren't. And third question, how much data does the method need to get the true tree with high probability? It's a math question. So right now this is all like mathematical statistics, right? Everything here so far is mathematical statistics. Last question, what are the computational issues? That is to say, you know, NP-hardness type questions, right? So that's computational statistics. So this, right now this sounds like statistics. And in some sense it is statistics. But you can't do a good job in answering these things without computer science. So here are the answers. We actually know a lot 
about which site evolution models are identifiable. We know a lot about which methods are statistically consistent. And we, we actually know a little bit about how much data methods need to recover the tree with high probability. These are all mathematical questions, very nice mathematical questions. But the take home message is you basically constrain the mathematical models and in ways that make them not biologically realistic, okay? In order to have identifiability. So, okay, so far this is sort of bad news, but I just want you to know that as, as computer scientists, as mathematicians, there's interesting research to be done about what happens when you have more realistic models. Okay, going on, back to statistical <coughs> consistency. Under the jukes kenner model, we have statistical consistency. Under more generalizable models that are more realistic, we still have statistical consistency for some methods, which is to say, as data goes to infinity, some methods will reconstruct the true tree with probability going to one, like maximum likelihood is a really nice method. Okay, but with genome scale data, is it enough? So basically the idea is, as the length of the genome increases, we should have maybe enough data to get the tree. Right? And people have thought, with genome assembly, the tree of life should be reconstructed. We should be done. And so remember, we have this assumption of IID site evolution. Everything is evolving down a single tree. That's the assumption that you're going on when you talk about statistical consistency. Is your data come from the same distribution. The problem is it's actually not that simple. Different parts of the genome have different histories. And even human chimp gorilla orangutan is complicated. So if you look here, human and chimp are siblings, right? And then gorilla, and then orangutan. That seems right. If you look here, human and gorilla are siblings. That seems wrong. So different parts of the genome have trees that are not the species tree. And this happens for many reasons. One of them is called incomplete lineage sorting, which is a very, very common occurrence that has to do with population genetics. Another one is gene duplication and loss, which is that genes duplicate. You have multiple copies of certain genes in your genome. And when they duplicate, that creates another kind of challenge. Then there's horizontal gene transfer, which happens in bacteria. And then there's hybridization, which creates you know, ligers and stuff like that. You know, so you get these very bizarre things happening across the genomes where the trees on different regions are different. So how do you even make sense of this? Like, how do you even talk about a tree of life when different parts of the genome have different histories? So the way that you can think about this is that the, the species tree is actually another mathematical model that generates gene trees. But you still have to think about how do you analyze your data, even if you take that perspective. ILS, which is incomplete linear sorting, and gene duplication and loss are really dominant issues in almost every phylogenomics project. So you have to have methods that can deal with this. And you have to think about HGT, horizontal gene transfer, and hybridization as well. Okay, so the, my basic point is that this is not a, these are not toy problems, these are real problems. <coughs> And here are some examples. The Thousand Plant Transcriptome Project from 2014. We recently published another paper in Nature on the same topic. Um, Multi-copy genes, we had to throw them out because we didn't have methods that could work with them. 9,500 genes to start with, about 400 after we threw out all the multi-copy genes. Massive gene tree heterogeneity of what was left consistent with incomplete lineage sorting. Okay, that's one project. The Avian Project, yeah? How, how prevalent is the assumption of no indels? No one believes that there are no indels. We no, no, all no, no. <laughs> I mean, but, in, but you, you mentioned that the, the, the assumption is that there's no indel. And then you didn't so the, the statistical models of sequence evolution, specifically, are that there are no indels. But there are indels. Indels means insertions and deletions. So sequences actually evolve with insertions and deletions as well as substitutions. So the very first step in a phylogenetic analysis is you produce what's called a multiple sequence alignment which is dealing with the indel problem. And then you treat the indels as missing data in your maximum likelihood analysis. So everyone knows there are indels, but they basically get around it by just treating the insertions and deletions not as events, but as missing data. 
And we can talk more about that later. It's a different topic. OK, so, but again, the births had the same thing. Multi-copy multi genes had to be thrown out. And then we had massive gene tree heterogeneity due to ILS. So both of these things affect biological discovery. So what I'm going to be telling you about today is how we have developed methods to address this kind of, either kind of heterogeneity. Let's start with ILS. The reason I'm going to start with ILS is because it's actually extremely well studied. Uh, for, for decades, there have been mathematical models about incomplete lineage sorting. Um, so this is like the Kingman coalescence. And the basic idea is you have these four individuals, and you're looking at a single gene. And for that single gene, you're looking at a single allele. And because it's a single allele, you can say, which parent did you get it from? And you can say, which parent of that parent did they get it from? And you can trace it back, OK? And you're tracing it back to their common ancestors <coughs> from which they got those alleles. So that's like the backward process, right? Um, so it's also mathematically modeled by saying, pick a random parent from the previous generation. Pick a random parent from the previous generation of that. And that random selection from the previous generation, so every row is a generation, you're actually eventually coming back and finding common ancestors. Like here, they managed to pick a common ancestor in common, so that's called coalescence. They came and they picked a common ancestor. But look what's happening up there. You have these two lineages in this, in this edge, in the tree. They never coalesce. So they come up here and there are three lineages. And because there are three lineages, the first pair that coalesces can be any pair. So look very carefully at the gene tree inside the species tree. And look at these two. If you look backwards in time, they're siblings in the gene tree. And they're not siblings in the species tree. Okay, So the species tree is a mathematical model that describes heterogeneity across the gene trees. And what's really disturbing is that every gene tree is possible. Because it's possible that there's no coalescence. You get up to the root, there's been no coalescences. And every gene tree has equal probability at that point. So the point is, it's a mathematical model. It's supported by population genetics theory. And it gives you this kind of distribution of gene trees that actually explains human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And that's why this mathematical model let us know that these guys are siblings, human and chimp. That's, that's the introduction. OK, but how do you do inference? You have a species tree that generates gene trees. And they're all different. The gene trees generate sequences with indels. And how are you going to reconstruct the species trees from this stuff, right? So there's a standard way of doing it now, which is that you just go backwards. You go from the sequences to the gene trees, and you go from the gene trees to the species trees. To go from sequences to gene trees, you're essentially doing maximum likelihood. And be hard, so you're using heuristics, but you can get estimated gene trees. To go from the gene trees to the species trees, that turns out to be a nice discrete optimization problem. So for the computer scientists in the audience, there's a really nice, clean optimization problem that gives you a statistically consistent estimate of the species tree. And that is nice to learn about. So back here, mathematical model, it generates species trees. Here's the theorem that makes everything possible. So Elizabeth Allman and her colleagues proved the following theorem, that under this multi-species coalescent, if you have four species, OK, only four species, you look at all of the gene trees. The most probable gene tree on the four species will be the species tree. Remember, you can see every possible version, right? The gene trees can be anything. But for four species alone, the most probable quartet tree, and there's only three possibilities, is the species tree. <coughs> OK, that's a theorem. It's actually not a hard theorem either. You can read the paper. But what it means in practice is that you have a species tree. It generates gene trees. You look at the proportion of the gene trees that you see in your data. The one that shows up the most often is your estimate of the species tree. And that's a statistically consistent method. OK, so you can get 
every quartet tree. And if you can get every quartet tree correctly, given enough data, you can get any species tree of any size. All of you who have had an algorithms course can come up with an algorithm for this. You can do a recursive algorithm, and you could solve it. Okay? You have, you have let's say, 50 species, and now you have every possible quartet tree. How do you figure out the species tree on all 50 species? Any ideas? You want to answer it. <laughs> okay, so here's one thing you could do. You could look for a sibling pair. Look for a pair of species that are never separated, A and B. So whenever they're in a quartet tree together, they're always siblings. Throw out one of them and recurse on what's left. Now you get a tree on everything else. And then just put A back in sibling with B. And that's your, that's your algorithm. Statistically consistent polynomial time algorithm will, will reconstruct the species tree correctly with probably going to one with enough data. Okay? A proof. A proof of statistical consistency in polynomial time. Okay. The only problem is that that algorithm doesn't work well because you can't have a single mistake. Here's a different algorithm. Optimization problem. You have all of the gene trees. You want to find a species tree that agrees with the maximum number of quartet trees. So you're summing up over all of the gene trees. You're looking at the quartet trees in the tree you compute and the quartet trees in the gene trees and the number they have in common, and you want to maximize that. Okay, discrete optimization. NP hard problem. But if you solve it exactly, you have a statistically consistent estimate of the species tree. Now, because it's NP hard, what Axel <coughs> does is it constrains the search space and it constrains it in a way that it does it from the input, and then it solves the constrained version in polynomial time using dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is a super powerful algorithmic technique. And if you don't already know it, please learn it. It's great. Polynomial time, statistically consistent estimate of the species tree. OK, so that's nice theoretically. But what's also nice is it's used all over. Astral is now the dominant method for doing species tree estimation taking gene tree heterogeneity into account due to ILS. And Astro, by the way, Siavish was my former PhD student. So pros and cons of Astral, um, mostly it's good. It's very fast. It's much faster than doing what is called a concatenation analysis, which is basically just take all the alignments, and concatenate them, and just run maximum likelihood. It's much faster than that. Um, it's statistically consistent. Um, it can, it, Sometimes it's better than concatenation. Sometimes it's not as good as concatenation. It depends upon the model conditions. The problem is that on some data sets, it's not that fast, which is to say on some data sets, you might be waiting several days before you've gotten an answer. OK, which leads to the first advance that I'm going to tell you about, uh, which is we need to make it scalable. But just here's an example. 250 CPU years for the concatenation analysis of the avian data. 250 CPU years. Only like 48 species. So we, we don't want to do concatenation, OK? But we would still want to make astral scalable. So the first contribution is this novel divide and conquer approach to doing species tree estimation. <coughs> In fact, it's a novel divide and conquer approach to doing any kind of phylogeny estimation. So imagine what you have is 10,000 species. And you want to get a species tree on 10,000 species, and you have whole genomes. How are you going to do this? Worse, you have 100,000 species, right? You have a large number of species. You can't run astral because it will not complete. Take your data set and divide into disjoint sets, small enough so that astral will complete on your machines. Run astral on each subset and get a tree. Now these are disjoint trees. You want to merge the disjoint trees together <coughs> so you compute some auxiliary information, such as a distance matrix. And then you can merge them together. But this is a generic thing that says take a data set, divide into subsets, get trees on the subsets, and then merge. What do I mean by merge? You could just connect the trees up by edges, and that would be like the top figure. Or you can let them blend. So I want to explain the blending. You see these three trees? One is on A, B, C, D. One is on E, F, G, H. And the other one's on I, J, K, L, right? The middle tree is actually 
a, su a, a compatibility super tree. So what do I mean? If you look at ABCD in the middle tree, you have AB separated from CD, right? If you look at EFGH, you have EF separated from GH. You look at IJKL, you have IJ separated from KL. So you're treating those trees as requirements, but you're allowed to blend them. Okay, you get this idea? You're allowed to blend. So, tree merge, we're gonna run astral to get the subsets, and we're gonna combine the trees together using a distance matrix with this method called tree merge. I'm not gonna describe how tree merge operates, it is published. Um, I'm just going to say how we're going to show results of simulated data, and here's how we quantify error. You have a, data, a tree that generates data, here's your inferred tree. You mark the edges of the inferred tree about whether or not they're correct. And so if this edge splits 3 and 5 from 1 to 4, this edge 3 and 5 from 1 to 4, it's not in that tree. This edge splits 1, 2 from 3, 4, 5. 1, 2 from 3, 4, 5 is in the true tree. So you mark the edges about whether or not they're <coughs> correct. Okay? The fraction that are wrong is your error rate. And both trees are fully resolved, so the, the false positive rate and the false negative rate are the same. We're just going to talk about the error rate, which is the fraction that's wrong. We'd like that to be zero. Okay. Here's a theorem about tree merge with astral. First, Tree merge is polynomial time. Second, it maintains statistical consistency. Empirical results are really nice. The top is error, the bottom is running time. So let me just take you through the top. Blue is astral by itself on the whole data set. Um, if I remember, these are a thousand, a thousand species and a thousand genes. Thanks. Astral by itself on a thousand species with a thousand genes. In orange is what you get when you do tree merge with astral. You can see that it doesn't matter which one you do in terms of accuracy. They're basically having the same accuracy. The model conditions are how much heterogeneity there is, low versus high, and two different kinds of genes. Look at the running time. Astral by itself or inside the divide and conquer? By itself or inside the divide and conquer? By itself or inside the divide and conquer, okay? It's just a really big difference in running time and no real change in terms of accuracy. So this is like astral by itself, more than 40 <coughs> hours, much, much, much less for inside the running time. So that's, that's tree merge. So there's value added for species tree estimation because it means you can take any basic, any data set and divide it into subsets according to how you want to analyze the subsets. You have a very expensive method, you can make it even smaller. Yeah? So is it 40 hours of CPU time or 40 hours of wall clock time because of increased parallelism? I think it's CPU, but what is it? It's wall clock. Okay. So there's increased parallelism in the CPU? Mm, no, actually the subset trees are estimated in serial, so it's... Uh, it's there's no parallelism. We're yeah. not, we could run it in parallel and get it even faster, <coughs> but this is the, okay. the serial time. So those of you who are wondering why someone in the audience is answering, is because Erin Malloy, who's the developer of all this, is in the audience, so she's going to be answering some of these questions. Okay. Okay, so great theoretical guarantees, great empirical performance. And this, already, this is already published. And there are other methods that do this disjoint tree merger. Tree merge is one of them. There are others as well. It's like a, a new thing that we're doing in the lab over like the last one year. So it's a very nice, powerful divide and conquer technique that just has tremendous flexibility. Okay, so generic technique, any kind of data, any kind of problem, you just make the subsets as small as you need them to be for the method you want to run. Okay, so the next topic is gene duplication and loss. So do you remember I showed you this thing where the avian project had to throw out data, the, the 1KP, the plant project had to throw out data, all these phylogenomics projects are throwing out data. They're throwing out data because they can't analyze it. So in phylogenomic analysis, if you have multi-copy genes, you really have two options. Throw out the data or figure out something called orthology, which is to say, figure out single copy stuff. And that's not reliable. So inevitably, you're throwing out data. Throwing out data or having errors. So how do we deal with gene duplication and loss in a rigorous way? I want you to look at this picture. It's really weird. This species tree, 
okay, ABC, rooted. There's a duplication at the root, so the gene is now two copies of the gene in your genome. And both copies evolved down to, through all the species. That's the gene tree. Do you see that gene tree? It has two copies of the species tree, right? So this, this is a multi-copy gene tree, which has two copies of the species tree. So now what you're trying to do is you're trying to infer species trees from these weird things. Multi-copy gene trees. And this is with duplication and, and no loss, but you could have loss. And you could also have incomplete lineage sorting, which would mess it up again. And of course, you also have gene tree estimation error, which messes it up again. So this is an example of what we call a mul tree, a multi-copy gene tree. And the challenge here is estimating a species tree from your data. And as I said, the, the, the usual way is you just pick one copy of each species that you're doing orthology. Usually, you'll make mistakes or you throw your data out. So how do we infer species trees from multi-copy gene trees? So there's, there's at least one person in the audience who probably has an answer. Um, but let me just tell you, over the last several decades, methods have been developed to do this that are sort of algorithmically appealing. But none of them have been proven to be statistically consistent. And if they're not statistically consistent, generally biologists don't like to use them. They want statistical consistency guarantees. So until a few weeks ago, nothing was established to be statistically consistent. What I'm about to show you are results that are unpublished, but are on bioarchive. Bio OK, so the first result, um, Brandon Legreed, Aaron and I, and Sebastian Roth, proved that astral multi, which is a version of astral, is actually statistically consistent for gene duplication and loss. So that's nice. Something that already exists that we didn't know would be consistent for this model is statistically consistent. But it's actually a pretty hard proof. So I'm not going to show you that proof. You can read the bioarchive paper. What I will show you, however, is this. Fast mul RFS <coughs> is a new method that Aaron developed, which is statistically consistent. And it has a very simple proof. And I'm actually going to try to show you the simple proof. But what it's consistent <coughs> under is a generic duplication only or generic loss only model. It may actually be consistent under both duplication and loss, but we don't have a proof yet. OK, so I'm going to show you how that works. Both of them are polynomial time. And both of them use um, dynamic programming to solve a constrained version of an NP-hard discrete optimization problem. So sort of the theme here is you can do statistical <coughs> estimation of importance by doing discrete optimization. And dynamic programming is a very powerful technique. So for the, the students in the audience, think, learn how to do dynamic programming. OK, so I'm going to show you this proof. OK, so again, the idea is we have these three gene trees, OK? These multi-copy gene trees. We want to estimate the species tree. We're going to have lots and lots of these multi-copy gene trees. We want to get the species tree. So think about what happens when you have only duplications. Well, before I get there, look at these edges. Like, look at this edge. This edge, remember how we talked about bipartitions? We talked about the leaves being split into two pieces? If you take this edge out, you get A and C on one side and B and D on the other. Actually, I take it back. This one, if you take this out, you just get B and then ACD. You take out this edge, you get AC versus BD. This is colored blue. And it's colored blue because it gives you a bipartition on the species set. The X's mean that we deleted stuff. So it's losses. Look here. This edge I colored red. Why did I color it red? If you look at, the look at the edges, how it splits things. You have AC, this edge. AC on one side, but then A, B, D on the other. So it's not a bipartition. It's not splitting the species into two disjoint sets. So it's colored red because it doesn't give you a bipartition. This one is red. It gives you A, B on one side and A, C, D on the other. So the edges that are black are, are adjacent to leaves. We don't worry about them. Everything else is either red or blue. <coughs> so why is this one blue? Because you have A, C versus B, D. Everything up there is red or black. Right? So here's the idea. If you only have duplications and you don't have losses, you won't have this kind of situation. You won't have this kind of situation. 
You only have that kind of situation. These have losses, these have losses, there's no loss up there. If you only have duplication, then suppose you, the root, and you're going down and you look at the first time you get a duplication. Until you get to a duplication, all of those edges actually give you real bipartitions. It's only when you get below a duplication that you don't have bipartitions. So the theorem, the observation is that if there's no gene loss, then every edge in any gene family tree that is not below a duplication node actually gives you a real split, a bipartition, and it will be colored blue. And everything that's below a duplication will be colored red. That's the first one. It's just the coloring. You get real bipartitions if you're above the duplication nodes. You don't get any uh, bipartitions if you're below. Theorem number one. Theorem number two, if there's no gene loss, then all the blue edges are actually in the species tree. So if there's no gene loss, every time you see a bipartition, it's from the species tree. And if it's from the species tree, you can use it. So that gets you to this really simple algorithm. Collect all the blue edges, and then just try to find a tree that maximizes the number of shared bipartitions. That's another discrete optimization problem. I give you a bunch of multi-copy gene trees. I'm going to collect all the bipartitions, and now I just want to optimize shared bipartitions. And that, unfortunately, is NP-hard. <coughs> Everything in phylogeny is NP-hard, but if you constrain it, you can get a polynomial time algorithm doing dynamic programming. That's fast, smaller, fast. Polynomial time, dynamic programming algorithm to solve a constrained version. And the constraint is done so you maintain statistical consistency. So here's results. This is what you get on 25 genes, and I'll show you what you get on more genes in a minute. This is running time. Green is obviously what we like. Green is Aaron's method. Now, this mul RF looks like fast mul RFS, right? This is a previous method. And it's a heuristic for this optimization problem, but it doesn't do constrained optimization. It's doing a heuristic search. So, astral multi, which is statistically consistent, dupe tree, which is a, a, an NP hard optimization problem, so it's a heuristic, Aaron's algorithm, and this. Running time for fast small RFS is the best, right? And accuracy, fast small RFS is tied essentially with small RF and the others are less accurate. That's on 25 genes and 100 species. Here's what we get when we look at the full range of number of genes. This is, for example, on 500 genes, 100, 50, and 25. It's always the fastest, and it's always tied for first. Yes? What is the black dot that's sometimes outside the uh, boxes? Um, those are the outliers. <coughs> so, so, okay. This is, again, moderately high incomplete linear sorting also. This is not a gene duplication and loss scenario. It's not a duplication only scenario. There's duplications, there's losses, there's also incomplete linear sorting, and there's actually high gene tree estimation error. So this is actually, a, these are hard model conditions, and we're getting the best accuracy of all methods very, very, very fast. So now is like my, my pitch to the the students. I am looking for graduate students, but even if you're not looking for graduate school, there's so much you can actually do that's actually relevant to biological discovery, and you don't actually have to become a biologist to do it. You actually can do it as an algorithms person. You can be an algorithms person doing discrete algorithms, paying attention to statistical models, but then doing your work as an algorithms person for speed and for accuracy and have an impact. You really don't have to understand biology to work in this area. Phylogeny is a very rich area with lots of mathematical modeling already present so that you can do the estimation problems. And there's lots of different kinds of research for the computer scientists to do. High performance computing is one. Um, parallel algorithms, graph algorithms, commercial optimization. There's a lot of machine learning as well. Uh, the question <coughs> that came up about indels, uh, multiple sequence alignment, and things that you do with multiple sequence alignments, a lot of that involves machine learning. I didn't talk about that uh, because of time. 
But there's many, many things you could do. So like I said, I am looking for graduate students, to some extent also looking for postdocs. Um, and I really hope that uh, if you're potentially interested, you come and talk to me. And then I just put up the acknowledgments. Sebastian Roth on the left, who's the mathematician who did some of this work. His student, Brandon uh, Siavish, my former student who did Astro, and Aaron, who is here. Thank you. want to interpret branch lengths as time as opposed to these other things, it's really complicated uh, because you basically have to say rates of evolution and connect them to uh, expected amount of change. Um, I don't believe any of the approaches to doing time because they rely upon really constrained uh, assumptions about the modeling, which I don't think are valid. So, but all of these methods can give you branch lengths. Um, Astral will give you branch lengths in terms of coalescent units. And therefore, um, the gene duplication and loss things can give you trees that you can then get branch lengths from Astral for coalescent units. So that, that's sort of my answer, but um, you, you may not like the answer. You have a secondary question? Well, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, oh, just put my mind. Um, oh, the ILS, the incomplete lineage sorting is a function of population demography, as well as everything else that you've talked about. So um, how so you, in other words, there's that? no random mating. So a lot of the assumptions about, income, a lot of the models that are done for ILS have to do with this assumption basically of picking a random parent from the previous generation. Um, I'm just going to go back and just put this picture back up. So this backwards process is based upon this pick a random parent from the previous generation, which is the same thing as like, you don't have too much uh, geographic space to pick from, right? It's not realistic. One of the things that's really nice about Astral is it's a non-parametric method. So all you need for Astral to work is that the most probable quartet tree is the species tree, which is much more robust to model misspecification. So these your, your point is an important one, and a lot of the parametric methods for doing species tree estimation under ILS, they're actually trying to optimize parameter fit, and the parameter fit can actually be much more uh, affected by model and the specification. So I think these non-parametric methods, which give you the, the discrete optimization problems, have a lot of power for that <coughs> reason.